that you would bless us today, that you would touch us and strengthen us, and Father, that we could hear your word today, that we would hear your voice, and that it would be clear, and that we would understand, and God, we would do what you've called us and asked us to do. Father, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated today. So I want to give you what I believe that I have heard from God Almighty. You know, God speaks to us and helps us. And today, I want to encourage all of you in this room. Everybody pay attention. I know we got people coming in and everything, but I want you to listen to this. I want to encourage everyone in this room to listen for the voice of the Lord today because He may speak to you to speak to us. He is a speaking God, and He has not stopped speaking to the body of Christ. And if there's ever been a time in our history when we need to hear from Him, we need to hear from Him today. We live in a community and a society where men and women cannot really tell who they are. They have lost all source of identity. They don't know who they are in God. They don't know who they are as a person, and they need that. So I want to ask you, and I want to encourage you as a congregation to hear his voice. As, As recorded and as in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, where God talked to his church, And he placed gifts in his church to encourage us and to help us along. Gifts of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of prophecy, healings, and those types of things. I want us to listen for his voice today. Let it be clear. Don't say what you think. Say what you hear. If you don't hear anything, don't say anything. Don't try to manufacture or bring up, but let God be God. Let him be who he divinely is. Let him be all that he is. But before I do that, I want to share a few scriptures with you, and then we will have a time of coming and breaking before the Lord. I believe the Lord definitely gave these verses to me today, and I'm going to just read a lot of them. And I'm going to ask you to pay attention to the reading of his word. I'm going to ask you to let that word go deep down into your heart and your soul. Today cannot be as all the other times we have gathered. This time must be different. I believe we are getting ready for revival with all that comes with revival. Complete healings, deliverances and salvations and sanctifications, Holy Spirit baptism, life restored to the fullness that God desires it to be. But before we can do that, there are some things that we need to do. We are quick to rush into the presence of God before we are ready to be in the presence of God. There is a time when you and I get ready to walk into that presence of the living God. We can't just run in wearing any old kind of garments. But we do rush into his presence wearing all kinds of garments. And then when we ask God for something and we do not receive it, it becomes his fault. But God said to us, there must be a change of clothing. And today we want to change our clothes. Begin to put on the things that God wants us to put on. I believe God wants us to have complete victory over everything that would hinder us. In 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 17 through 19, this is what the Lord said, or the prophet said to the king. And he said, open the east window, and he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance And the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Apex till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took the arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and stopped. 
And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria until you had defeated or destroyed it. But now you will only strike Syria three times. And that is the problem sometimes is we are not striking the ground enough time to destroy the enemy. We are simply getting a little bit of victory, but God wants us to have complete victory, and we need to strike the ground with the arrow of the Lord until we have completely run off the adversary that is in our life. God does not want us to live a half of victory. He did not send Jesus Christ to die on a cross, be resurrected so you and I I could live beneath what God desires us to live. He desires us to be and to have complete victory. He did not die so anyone in his body could live beneath the privilege granted to a child of God. But we can do that. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it something else. Put it back. Matthew 21, 13 through 14. Jesus said, it is written. Now, when Jesus spoke to people in the Bible... He always said, I say unto you. But when he was addressing a spirit, he always said, it is written. Now, he's addressing the Pharisees in the temple, but they are possessed of a spirit that is not like the Father. We, know what the, we do know what the Pharisees did to Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees are the ones that crucified him. They were definitely not of the right spirit. And he said, it is written. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Put it back. Put it back. Put it back is my words. That's what he's saying there. Put my house back. Put it back when it's supposed to be. And I want you to look at verse 14. After he had driven the money changers out, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Not before, but after. And we will get nothing before we set his house in order, but only after. Amen. Only after we make it a house of prayer. Your life needs to be a house of prayer so that then can happen in your life. If you're tired of the same... We need a then. But then does not happen until. Then can never happen until happens. My house shall be called. My house shall be called. A house of prayer. But you... And he does say, but you. Everybody say, but me. But me. But me. We need to do some things. You want to know what's hindering you? You are. But me. But you. But you have. You polluted my house and therefore I will not work. But when you get that out, then will happen. Some of you need some then. In your life. Because as a Christian, you go around carrying a bunch of stuff that you do not need to carry. Let's look at some things that we might need to get rid of. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6 through 9. Everybody pay attention. You better pay attention. This is what the Lord says. Is this not the fast I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free. You better get this. And that you break how many yokes? Every yoke. Every yoke. 
Everything in your life that's bugging you, everything in your life that's hindering you, and you say, I can't get victory because, be quiet. Stop talking. You're saying the devil's words, not God's words. God does not say that anywhere. He said that every yoke in your life would be destroyed. Every yoke to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke, every one of them. Depression, anxiety, fear, anger, whatever. Sickness. Let me tell you a scripture. Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, really our prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you believe there's depressed people in heaven? Sick people. Deranged people. No. Demon-possessed people. No. That's what God wants it to be like on earth in our house, in our churches. You're not living that, we're living beneath it. I'm standing in that line to get some help myself, okay? Let's read a little bit what we need to get rid of. Is it not to share your bread with hungry, with the hungry, and that you should bring to your house the poor who are cast out? We would never do something like that, would we? Not really. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be, a, be your rear guard. Then you shall call in the name of the Lord, and he will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. Here I am. After you've done some things, listen to me. Here I am if, everybody say if, if I... The Bible, it says there, if you, that's God talking to all the people, if you, so we can say, if I, if I will take away the yoke from your midst, if you'll take away the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness. Do you know what that refers to? Having a critical spirit. We criticize everything and everybody. And it stops God. When you find yourself saying, they don't, they did, they should have, I don't understand why they just critic, 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 critic. You need to stop. You need to stop criticizing. Stop criticizing. Stop complaining. Stop speaking wickedness about people. Your words, according to Proverbs 18, have tremendous power. They have so much power, they bring life or they bring death. To people you speak over spiritually and to your own self. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot allow those things to be in our life. Amen? We cannot allow those things. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9 through 15. This is the story of Elijah with a J and Elijah with an S. Two different guys. Names sound a lot alike. One of them is J, one of them is S. J comes before S. Ja, Elijah came before Elisha. Even in the alphabet, that's what comes first. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, Ask what I may do for you before I am taken away from you. Elijah said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so. But if, you, but if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah, with an S, saw it. And he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes. Elijah with an S grabbed his own clothes. And the Bible said he tore them in half and threw them off. You see, we're wanting God to bless us while we're still wearing the old clothes. While we're still wearing the old clothes. Let me read the story. Oh my God, I wept when I read the scriptures today, this week, I wept. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. They fell off on the ground. 
He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the river Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. It parted. And Elijah crossed over. He crossed over the first time. They'd already crossed the river once. They went over the, the river the first time on the power of Elijah with a J. When he came over the second time, it was with the power that was on him with Elijah with an S. That's important. But that could not happen until, until the old garment was torn apart. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. My God. If there's ever, e hallelujah, if there's ever been a time when we need to hear, if there's ever been a time you and I need to really do inventory, it's in this beginning of this new year. I'm going to read some more scriptures, and then we're going to take some time to really start down inventory lane. Don't play games today. Please do not play. Be honest with God. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. We always think it has to be somebody else. But the Bible said in James, if you do it, all of us collectively... I read a story of a church back in the 50s that anytime anybody in their church got sick with anything, that whole church came together and started praying for 24 hours. I mean, there would be somebody in there praying. They never had anybody sick in their church over three days, ever, in the history of that church. And that's amazing to me. I don't want to miss anything today because I wrote it all down. Now, Genesis chapter 35, verse 1 through 7. When I read these scriptures this week or last week, I wept as I realized I needed to put away anything in my life that was preventing God from. And I just got a blank there. You can fill in the blank with your life. I filled in my blank. Things in our life can cause us to live less than he wants us to live. But when we get those things exposed, confessed, and repented for, his glory and his presence returns. Amen? In Genesis 35, 1 through 7, this is such a beautiful story and so powerful. If you're reading the one-year Bible, you've read that in the last week or so. Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel. The word Bethel there means house of God. Remember, this is the place that Jacob had ran to when he was running from Esau. And he had a dream, and in the dream there was a ladder going up and down to heaven, and he got up and he set a pillar and said, This is the house of God. Poured oil on and said, This is the house of God. So God comes to him 20-some years later and says, Go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household, and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. You get up, you be active, and you take and get rid of everything in your life that's before you. You do that. You do that. Something prof profoundly wonderful will happen when you do that. Put away all the idols that are among you. Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes, your garments. Symbolic of us changing our spiritual garments. Change your clothes. Two times we've seen change your clothes. Now, I don't have clothes in the back for you to put on. We're going to put it in the spiritual realm. Then let us arise and go to Bethel. Then let us go to the house of God. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the days of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their land.
I've got to find my place again. I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the days of my distress and has been with me all the days which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their land and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And those cities did not pursue them. We need to change our garments so that the devil does not have a reason to pursue us in our homes and in our lives. We need this. He cannot pursue us. So Jacob came to Lutz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, and he said to the people that were there, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. He changed the name before it was house of God, and now it's the God of the house. El Bethel means the God of the house. Before it was, we're going to the house of God. And then Jacob said, we're going to the God of the house. And that's where we need to be today is at the God of the house. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brothers. God told Jacob to go. In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, is the story of the return of the Ark of the Covenant to the house of God. Now, in David's time, the central place of worship was the temple under Saul, but under Saul's weak reign, under Saul, the Ark of the Covenant had been carried away. It was no longer there. The Ark of the Covenant, they had picked it up and took it off. The devil carried the Ark of God. The Ark of God represented God's presence, and the presence of God was carried away from the house of God. And when David began to reign, he said, Something is very wrong with this temple. There is no presence. Let us go back. And get the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Let, me, let me break that down for you. David, the king, realized there was no Ark of the Covenant, and the walk of the people of Israel had become mediocre. Their heart was anything but hot after God. They were kind of ho-hum. In other words, la, 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 la. And that's where a lot of church is today. La, 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 la. And we're not getting anything from God. But David gathered the people and said, let us go get the ark and bring it back. It left on a cart, and he brought it back on a cart. Today, I believe we are about to experience a powerful return of his presence in this place. Let me read the story to you. Sorry, I have to come down here, but the older I get, the smaller those letters get. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel. 30,000 people went to get the ark. They weren't going to make war. They were just going to get the ark and bring it back to the house. And they shouted and danced. If, you, if, you heard about, if you've ever read the story of the return of the ark, they would go a few feet and have church. They'd go a few feet and have church. They'd go a few feet and have church. My God, we can't get to church once a week. They were in church 45 times in one day. We cannot get to church once a week. And twice a week would be almost unspeakable or unthinkable for some of us. I'm not being mean today. I'm just, I'm just trying to be as honest and as transparent as I possibly can be before the throne. Gather all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. David rose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubs. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. You notice they didn't put it on the cart that it left on. They put it on a brand new cart. We want God's presence to be on us. It's got to be brand new. It's not going to be the old stuff we presented for it. Because if you, present, if you come before God today with the same old hurt and the same old aggravation, the same old hurt feelings and offenses in your life, the same jealousies and envies and strifes and bitterness, and if you come with all of that, just realize you're getting nothing. Because you're, you're trying to put God on an old ark. 
on an old cart. You can't put his presence on an old cart. But on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abadiah, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abadiah, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, and stringed instruments, and tambourines, on, on sistrums, and on cymbals. You think they didn't play loud music? They got busy. And the devil has made some feel like you have loud music in church. It's wrong. But it ain't. A new cart, a new garment, a new presence, and a new place. Amen? I have a few more scriptures that I'm just basically going to read. I'm not going to preach them. I'm just going to read them. The song, the last song that we sang said this, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." So I'm simply going to read through these verses. I have them in my, I've already printed them and I have them here, but they're going to show them on the board. You can write them down if you want to, but I'm just going to read them in just a few minutes. And I want to tell you today that I stand before you broken, humbled, and desperate for him. I am broken, and I am humbled, and I am desperate to know God. I am desperate to know Him. I am desperate to hear His voice. I am desperate. I am desperate. And I want to tell you today, do not place faith on feelings. We always say, well, I didn't feel anything. Now, that's not what the Bible says faith is. Faith is just simply believing what God has said. Feelings are emotions, and there's nothing wrong with having feelings. But you can't base what you get from God on a feeling. You must base it upon what His Word says. Tis so sweet just to take Him at His Word. Here is His Word spoken to you. Matthew 18 and 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. John 14, 13 and 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Mark 5, 25. Oh, we're going to read that whole thing down through 32. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. This is a story of Jesus going to the centurion's house, Jairus, to heal the daughter. And on the way, there's a bunch of people gathered around him, touching him everywhere. And he's on the way to this house, and these crowds around him, and he gets interrupted by a woman. This is her stories, but there's two stories. My wife reminded me there's two stories in that verse. Read the first story before you read the second story. Here's the second story. She had an issue, a flow of blood for 12 years, and suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said... She said, if I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see, who, to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing that what had happened it to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, she said and he said, she said, if I can, he said, you did. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go your peace and be healed of your affliction. Matthew 9, 28, and when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to him, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe it? If you, if you today are asking for anything and you say, I believe God can, but 
you don't believe. But I've been this way forever. No, you don't have to. You've been that way by choice. I'm going to be very honest with you. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be. According to your faith, let it be. To you. Matthew 8, 13. Then Jesus said to the Assyrian, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done to you. And his servant was healed that very hour. Would you stand with me today? I presented to you several things. I presented to you striking the enemy until he's out of your life through fasting and prayer. I brought to your attention that we cannot go around criticizing and pointing fingers and finding something wrong with everything and everybody and everything other people do. We are good at that. I really do get tired of hearing criticism. I really do. Because I realize that it hinders everything when we point fingers. I mean, that, that scripture in Isaiah said, if you point the finger and criticize and ridicule and run down, and God said, I didn't choose that kind of fast. If, if you're going to do that, you might as well not fast. I didn't choose that. So I brought that before you. If that's part of your life, then confess it. Whatever's a part of your life, you need to confess it. And I'm talking about criticizing your companion, your spouse, your kids, your neighbor, your, or anybody else that you might know, your, your, work, your co-worker. We're not supposed to criticize and point fingers at anybody. And the enemy knows that little nuances in Scripture. And so if he can't get you to do anything else, if he cannot get you to do anything else, he will give you a critical spirit. And that will be your downfall and your prevention. So I've talked about that. I've talked about changing your clothes, taking off the old garments and putting on the new garment. I've talked to you about putting God's presence on a new cart. You need to be a new cart. You're an old cart trying to carry the Word of God, and it's not working. You cannot carry God's Word on an old cart. you got to get it on a new one. So get, get your life on a new cart. I presented the simple scriptures here that simply says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That is as plain as Jesus Christ can get to us. So I'm going to open this altar for prayer for us, before we pray for all that other stuff, for us to come. And for us to begin to allow God to clean us. Do you need Kleenex? They're under the seats for you. For God to clean us. Boy, I've been searching the last few weeks since I began this fast. I have wept and cried and pleaded with God. Oh, God. Search me. And it's not been real good for some of the things he's shown me. I've needed to change. <laughs> so if you today want to take off your old clothes, if you want to put the presence of God on a new cart, this altar's open and you can join me. I'm not going to plead with you. I'm not going to beg with you. You can have what the Bible says you can have. Or you can have what you say you can have. Now, which one would you rather have? You can continue to criticize and to find fault. You can continue to wear the old clothes or you can put on new ones. That is your choice. For me, I'm stripping off. I'm getting it off of me. I have got to know him. I am desperate to know him. I am desperate. 